All right, so welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here today for our special topics webinar series on cooperative management and governance with the International Center for Cooperative Management. Uh, we're lucky to be able to run a series where we continually bring together speakers who can help us in terms of digging deeply into the conversation about how we have a nuanced business model and what that means in terms of practice, operations, leadership, uh, and the directions that we want to take, especially in exceptional times like we find ourselves in now. I'm Erin Hancock. I'm the manager of the educational programs within the International Center of Co-op Management. We also do knowledge dissemination, such as symposia, a working paper series, this webinar series, and uh, we also do research as well. So thank you for being part of our community. As I mentioned before, we have lots of grads and current students on the phone or on the line here today. And, uh, and we're happy to be able to bring forward to you Dr. Danielle Cote for our special webinar series today. We still have a number of webinars left in this series, so I invite you to visit our website at managementstudies.coop to be able to register for upcoming webinars that are also free. Um, we also have a two-day course on member-centric management and governance coming up in December, and we're offering that again in February as well that's happening online. So if you haven't been able to join us before in person, this is an opportunity to join us from around the world uh, during these times when we've moved everything to online, of course. So I'll tell you a little bit about what's coming down today. Hopefully many of you have heard of Dr. Danielle Cote. Some of you have studied with him and worked with him before. And so we're really pleased because Danielle has been a uh, professor in our program for a number of years. So we do an online part-time master's graduate diploma and certificate in cooperative and credit union management uh, offerings. And so uh, to, to highlight uh, some of Danielle's history, uh, he was uh, teaching in the business school in Montreal at HSA from 1983 to 2013. And since 2006, he's been teaching in our programs at St. Mary's, specifically in round co-ops and credit unions. Uh, he is currently working on the second edition of his book on cooperative management. I'll put a link uh, in the chat as well so people can check that out if they want to purchase it uh, either digitally or you can get a physical copy. And, uh, and he continues to work both as a practitioner in the sector, uh, chairing his cooperative in Montreal, as well as a consultant to many cooperatives and credit unions. And, uh, and his description could go on for a long time. So we're really lucky to have you here today, Danielle. The thing I most appreciate about Danielle is he takes uh, he, he tries to find ways of succinctly describing what can and should be happening in cooperatives in terms of management and governance, and then brings in lots of cases to bring those to life. So, Danielle, I appreciate your learning style and uh, your teaching style, and uh, I'll, I'll hand the floor over to you. If people have any questions today, please do put them in the chat to myself, Aaron, and, uh, and otherwise we'll be able to open up the lines toward the end for people to ask questions. Thank you, Danielle. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Aaron. Uh, and uh, hi, everyone. Um, it's very exciting for me to be here. It's always exciting for me to uh, talk about this stuff. Uh, uh, I've been uh, doing research on cooperative management for, uh, gosh, almost 40 years now. So uh, can you believe that? Uh, I don't, but uh, maybe you will. Uh, what I want to share with you uh, today is the work that I've done, and I would say mostly over the last 25 years. Uh, uh, the focus that I really want to address today, uh, and this is what you see on my first slide there, is really about this notion of a competitive advantage. Um, I've been working on a new cooperative paradigm since uh, uh, actually 1996. Uh, so it's been a long time. It's been quite a journey for me. But the focus has always been to try to understand uh, this notion of uh, cooperative competitive advantage. So you'll see uh, what we get uh, when we get there. But uh, the work that I've done, as Aaron said, uh, has been research, but I've been always very much involved also with with the cooperative uh, managers and practitioners. Uh, I've done research uh, surveys and a bunch of cases, cooperative cases, uh, and I've also worked with the cooperative management team through what we call the action research, uh, and I'm still doing that actually. And of course, I've been on the board of a number of cooperatives. I'm, I'm still the chair of the board of a uh, consumer cooperative, a community cooperative at HEC, the business school where I was uh, teaching. 
so essentially uh, that's the approach that I've had over the years and I'm always very concerned by uh, the importance of being able to validate you know uh, the, the stuff that I'm trying to organize and put together and make sure that eventually this is something that can be transferred into uh, uh, real life in, in cooperatives. But uh, talking about this notion of uh, competitive advantage, I've, I've been, uh, of course, hearing and talking with uh, people about this for a long time. And really what strikes me all the time when we address this issue is how little people know about the, the notion of competitive advantage. If we want to be able to uh, talk about uh, cooperative competitive advantage, we have to have an idea of what it is that we can call a competitive advantage. So uh, in the business world, uh, at HEC, I was teaching business strategy. And uh, when we're talking about the sustainable competitive advantage, the model that you see there is the one that is being used actually. So I just want to flash this out because I think it's important that whatever you know I'm gonna be talking about in terms of looking for competitive advantage in the context of the cooperative model, we need to be able to validate you know, uh, what we're saying with respect to a more rigorous approach with respect to this notion of sustainable competitive advantage. So what you have there in the uh, in the uh, rectangle in the middle, uh, it is really the four questions that uh, we always have to answer in order to be able to say that we have a resource, for example, that is a source of sustainable competitive advantage. So, uh, and there uh, I'm using and I'm looking at the cooperative model as a resource. Uh, of course, we can you know, uh, break it down and we will uh, in a minute, but uh, it's important that we're looking at uh, cooperative as a resource. So it has to uh, generate value, no problem there. It has to be rare. If the resource is not rare, it's not gonna be a competitive advantage. It has to be in perfectly uh, immutability. I mean, that's the word that I always have uh, difficult to, difficulty to say. These words that are the same in French and English, to me, it's always a bit tricky is so much easier in French. Uh, but anyway, so uh, immutability is an important issue as well if we want to talk about the sustainable competitive advantage. So if a resource is easily uh, immutable, of course it's not gonna be rare very long and it's not gonna be uh, sustainable over time. Uh, when we're talking about immutability, the three elements that uh, we need to look at is, uh, the first one is the notion of uh, uh, history dependent. Uh, when uh, a resource uh, can be developed over time or at a certain moment in time, uh, and this history is gonna be difficult to replicate, then of course, imitation will be, will be difficult. Causal ambiguity, when it's so complicated that nobody understands what's going on there, it, it is there, but we just don't understand what it is. Uh, that in itself also makes it difficult to imitate. And the third element is social complexity. So more it's social, even if you understand, when it's so complex uh, that you cannot really uh, copy it and imitate it. So imitability is really important. And the fourth element is substitutability. So those are the four questions that uh, we need to look at in order to be able to answer the question of cooperative competitive advantage. So that being said, that being said, I want to jump in right away to this notion of cooperative, the new cooperative paradigm, paradigm that I've been developing for, uh, as I said, since 19, 1996. What really uh, got me started on this notion of a uh, new cooperative paradigm is a book that I was reading uh, in at that, at that time, 96, as I said, about the loyalty management. And the author of this book uh, was a uh, American consultant uh, who, uh, when he was talking about, uh, about uh, loyalty, he was making references a great deal of organizations of cooperative natures or mutual nature. So this is at that moment that I started to realize that looking for emerging strategies uh, and revisiting the cooperative model could be a, a way of looking at uh, this notion of competitive advantage. But if I put that in the context of the, the most recent work that I've been doing uh, since I retired from HSA in 2014, I've been focusing, as Aaron just mentioned, on a book uh, that I published uh, first in 2018. Uh, and I'm rewriting right now the, uh, the whole theory section. Uh, 
So the context that I was focusing on was really the context that really allows us to go to send actually how market are being transformed actually, how the markets are being transformed actually. And those are the things that you know because uh, you, you, you live through these things all the time, access to information, transparency, increased competition, power of customers, and we could go on and on and on with this. So with these market transformations, what I've been trying to do is look at emerging strategies and these emerging strategies need to have impact, to have an impact on this notion of sustainable competitive advantage. And these strategies uh, can be found in the, in the capitalist organizations as well as cooperatives, by the way. That, you know, having uh, identified these emerging strategies, then I need to uh, revisit, revisit the cooperative model and see how we can really go after these strategies that are a source of competitive advantage by uh, enhancing and leveraging actually the cooperative distinctiveness and pushing that further then we can look at the inherent sources of competitive advantage in the co-op model actually uh, focusing on these emerging strategies so that's the context that i've been working on for the last these last 25 years and the focus for me is really about the new cooperative paradigm. So the whole, the whole idea of a paradigm shift is, is, uh, is really important there. So this is really uh, how I captured this, this idea of a new cooperative paradigm. So in this slide here, what you have uh, on the right uh, is what I refer to as the traditional cooperative paradigm, which is what you know. I mean, uh, no need to, to go through all of that, but the principles and the values are all there. Uh, and uh, moving towards the new cooperative paradigms, the strategies that I've been focusing on over the last 25 years, but you know, mostly the things that I've been working on since uh, you know, I would say the last five, six years, you know, there are four strategies there that you see on the left that I say that I see as emerging strategies. The notion of congruence of values, the notion of psychological ownership, loyalty and engagement. The whole concept of engagement is becoming, has become such an important concept uh, in, the, in the world. And, uh, and uh, the literature on this notion of uh, customer engagement is just booming actually. It has been booming for quite some time already. So this concept of uh, customer engagement is really, really important. And the whole, the whole aspect of co-creation of value, democratization and co-creation of value. Today, I'm not gonna be able to cover all of that. I just want to give you an idea of, you know, how I'm approaching these things. So I'm gonna be talking about essentially uh, congruence of values and psychological, psychological ownership. I hope that I'm gonna be able to, to do that properly uh, without Erin uh, calling me out because she said that you know, I couldn't be talking for more than 30 minutes. When I'm, by the way, when I'm presenting these things in my executive seminars, you know, I have three days to do that. And when I'm doing this in the St. Mary's program, I have three months to do that. Now I have 30 minutes, so uh, you have to bear with me on that. It's not gonna be easy for me to uh, be uh, able to do what I really want to do. But anyway, so those are the idea of the new cooperative paradigm that you have right there. And the questions that I've just uh, laid out for you are the questions that to me need to be answered. So on this notion of, uh, of the congruence of values, uh, looking at the literature uh, on, on uh, you know, my starting point uh, to go to this idea of congruence of values, my starting point was really on the mobilization based on values. That was really the starting point that I had uh, 25 years ago. So going back to it, uh, you know, five, six years ago, and digging into the literature, I came across this concept of uh, congruence of values between the person, the employee, and the organization. So that really uh, is what got me uh, started. But you know, when we're looking at this, as uh, you you see on the slide there. Uh, we're not talking about a specific set of values. We're just talking about the idea that employees' values and organizational values, uh, when you have a good fit there, you have a, an impact in terms of some job satisfaction and commitment in terms of turnover rate, as you see there. But going further and you know digging even more on this on this concept i uh, came across a model by a guy by the name of schwartz schwartz is a a uh, a israeli israeli uh, sociologist who has been working on this notion of values human values for a long long time he started publishing on that about 40 years ago 
and he's really a reference actually in terms of human values so it's really uh, something to uh, really to pay uh, very close attention to and the model that uh, Schwartz has been able to and I will connect with uh, cooperative values in a minute so bear with me on that uh, the uh, the model that uh, Schwartz has been able to develop actually and to test uh, around the world, he has been able to, with his colleagues, uh, test and validate this model empirically uh, in more than 80 countries around the world. So what you have there is a series of 10 values that you see there. It's a, a circular model and Schwartz see these values as a source of motivations leading to, uh, you know, given behaviors. So I'm not going to go uh, through all these 10, uh, 10, uh, uh, 10 values, uh, though I want to uh, share an important element uh, with respect to this model in the sense that what uh, Schwartz is doing, he's uh, re, uh, organizing his, these values into two main axes. The first one being conservation and uh, openness to change that you see here. And the other one being self-enhancement and self-transcendence. Just to put things in, in context, uh, uh, so you see there what, what uh, Schwartz is doing, uh, looking at the impact of values on motivations. And so these values being a uh, continuum actually uh, focusing on human, human, human needs. And, and, and one point that needs to be, uh, is important is that when, when people uh, recognize the, their hierarchy of values, more explicitly, uh, then they are going to be, uh, you know, much more motivated to align their behavior with reference to this uh, value system. So uh, what Schwartz does, again, is to uh, really uh, organize these 10 values into these two axes. The two axes that the, 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 the one axis, the one axis that to me is mostly important is uh, what he calls self-enhancement and self-transcendence. And you'll see uh, the connection with the cooperative values uh, in, a, in a second there. So the notion of self-enhancement is really uh, where people are motivated by self-interest, as opposed to self-transcendence, where the motivation is to promote the welfare of others and, and nature. So having recognized that the Schwartz is coming up with this model that is empirically validated throughout the world and is universally uh, recognized then I start ask, asking myself uh, what is the connection that we can do with the cooperative values there and uh, what I come up with uh, was the idea that you know what Schwartz call, uh, calls self-transcendence which essentially captures the idea of universalism and benevolence as he calls it and you see the key words that he's using there to describe you know, universalism and benevolence. Equality, social justice, protection of the environment, helpfulness, loyalty, honesty, and forgiving. So I'm reading that stuff, uh, you know, and again, I'm trying to find something to go on in terms of new cooperative paradigm. And I'm reading that stuff by, by Schwartz and I'm connecting very quickly to uh, the idea that self-transcendence actually is, very much aligned with what we call cooperative values, which is what you see there, it's mutual help, uh, democracy, equality, solidarity, honesty, transparency, altruism, and social responsibility. So there is a very strong connection and communication and uh, natural uh, attachment between uh, Schwartz's uh, uh, self-transcendence and, and uh, the, uh, the, the cooperative values. So that's one thing that I thought was really, really important and significant. And then we can learn from cooperative value through Schwartz stress transcendence. And one thing that we can learn, and this is something that Schwartz was able to do, because as I said, he tested his model in more than 80 countries, in 80 countries around the world. And one thing that he did was to uh, evaluate the relative importance of these values actually. Uh, and this is what you see there. So it's a bit, uh, uh, maybe a bit more, uh, too much information there, but I just want you to pay attention to what Schwartz is referring to here as the uh, rating of importance according to uh, these, these values. And what is really interesting here is that uh, self-transcendence is seen by Schwartz and his team as the most important value profile around the world. 
the percentage that they come up with is just about 60 to 65 percent. So what these researchers are telling us is that self-transcendence in terms of value profile, universalism and benevolence, essentially reflect a value profile of more than 60% of the planet, actually. So if you uh, stick with me on the idea that the cooperative values and self-transcendence are very much the same thing in so many ways, it tells us something about cooperative values that is very important. To me, that was a really important discovery that I was doing there. And self-enhancement, self-enhancement is much more aligned with the capitalist model, capitalist values. And it is seen there as the third most important actually. So because I'm curious, because I'm still very much involved with Co-op HCC, which is a, uh, a community cooperative that deals with a bunch of things that at HEC, this business school I was working with, I'm still chairman of the board, as I said, and I'm doing a bunch of uh, studies uh, and surveys with, with our members. We have about uh, 15,000 members and $10 million of business. And I decided that I was going to check if Schwartz was right with respect to uh, Co-op HEC. And it turns out that it's, this is exactly uh, the result that I got. Uh, the, the community of HEC students, employees, HEC has about 1,000 employees and something like 275 fac faculty members. It's a big business school. And when I'm looking at, through the survey that I did with them, when I'm looking at uh, the profile, the value profile at, uh, in this business school, I found very much the result that uh, Schwartz was giving. So I thought it was an interesting discovery that I was, I was, uh, I was coming up with there. And the self-enhancement value is about the third of the, the people who responded to this, this questionnaire. So we're learning things here. We're learning that, uh, and again, I'm looking for a new cooperative paradigm. So we're learning that we can approach cooperative values through this notion of congruence of values by looking at Schwartz, who talks about self-transcendence, which is another way of talking about cooperative values. And we're learning that the cooperative values, self-transcendence is the most important profile around the world. So those are important findings right there. But then I start to question myself, what do my colleagues in HR are saying about Schwartz? If I'm asking them, what do they have to say about the cooperative values? I know the answer to that. The answer is nothing because they don't work on that. But when I start to integrate, you know, and to, to look at the literature, uh, searching for uh, HR uh, research and, 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 and Schwartz value, then I have a bunch of things that really are coming up because Schwartz is such an important reference. So, uh, and there uh, I'm gonna, you know, be presenting that in a nutshell because I don't have time uh, for uh, any, any, any more than that. But there are a number of things that uh, are really, uh, really important that uh, we can find actually uh, looking at self-transcendence as a core value uh, in, in organizations. And the first thing that is being shown is that when we have people with a profile of self-transcendence, mostly benevolence, these people will have a higher propensity to cooperate, cooperate as opposed to compete among employees. If you have employees with a profile of uh, self-enhancement, uh, which is essentially another way of saying uh, personal achievement uh, and, and uh, accumulation of wealth, uh, then these people will have more uh, a, uh, a tendency to compete with one another. So there is an element there that is interesting that uh, will be of uh, you know, a great value for, for organizations. A, a second finding that I, I, I came across with is this notion of effective commitment. When we're looking at organizations, what the HR specialists are, are talking about in terms of commitment, they're talking about effective commitment, they're talking about normative commitment, and they're talking about continuous commitment. Of course, the type of commitment that uh, we are more interested in is effective commitment, because this is the type of commitment where people share on the values, and they share on the, the mission and the purpose of the organization. And this is something that is inherent in themselves. So in terms of commitment, 
we're you, we're going to be able to 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 go much further with with people with effective commitment, as opposed, for example, to uh, continuous con continuance commitment. Uh, continuous commitment is when people don't have a choice. Actually, they're staying in your organization because they don't have a choice. They don't have an alternative, or if they were to leave, to to leave, they would be losing too much salary position and what have you so effective commitment is really really what is of importance and when we're looking at what effective commitment brings to the organization what we found and this is all these things that i was able to document through empirical evidence that hr specialists are coming up with the whole notion of pro-social behavior for example is one of them the notion of discretionary behavior in other words difficult for me to say discretionary in french discretionary behavior is very important and i'm going to you know get to this in a moment ethical competence is also something that i was able to document and find empirical evidence linking effective commitment to ethical competence so what i'm saying here is that by looking at self-transcendence which is another way of talking about cooperative values. We have a, a higher propensity to cooperate, cooperate. We have a higher propensity to, for people to be, to have a effective commitment towards the organization with the type of, the type of behaviors that I'm showing here. And all of that will lead to a, a set of, you know, a high HPWP means high power uh, work uh, work practice actually, which is a way to capture the uh, HR policies, uh, and all of this will lead to a higher performance. So we're getting closer to the notion of competitive advantage there, because and now uh, you have we, twelve minutes left. Oh wow! Okay. <laughs> So you see, I knew I would be in trouble right away. Uh, so the idea of discretionary behavior is there. Uh, when we can really get people into uh, a discretionary mode, uh, which is in, in another way of presenting that is the idea that uh, those are type of behaviors that are left at the discretion of people. And the discretionary behavior is going to have a very significant impact on the organization. So being able to connect effective commitment with discretionary behavior is really, really important. So this is what leads to extra role. And uh, this is really what is actually a, a reflection of how people are using their time and talent. So, uh, and all of this leads to, for me, to uh, a better understanding uh, of the notion of the competitive advantage that we can get. Uh, at first, I said that uh, the uh, the uh, I was looking at cooperative as a resource, but then when we break it down and we're looking at the values, cooperative values, through this notion of self transcendence uh, and all these behaviors that I've been documenting uh, through uh, what I found in the HR literature and empirically validated, what we can say there is that cooperative values bailed into this notion of congruence of values so employee values and organization values so if we build on this notion of self-transcendence then we're going to have a, a set of behavior that will enhance the organization performance so that's the idea of sustainable competitive advantage right there so uh, the uh, second strategy that I want to show uh, is uh, the one that uh, deals with this notion of psychological ownership. When I discovered this notion of psychological ownership, uh, just about uh, five years ago when I started to read that, uh, that uh, literature, it was really uh, a, a shocking literature for me because all these years working on cooperatives, I thought that uh, to me, uh, when I was thinking about ownership, I was essentially uh, thinking about legal ownership. And focusing on this concept of psychological ownership, I came to realize that uh, not only as I'm gonna show uh, uh, the cooperative model, the cooperative design, uh, ownership design is such an important one to go after uh, psychological ownership uh, in, in the first place, but also it, I, you know, I came to realize that uh, uh, in the context of cooperative ownership, what is really important is uh, psychological ownership. Legal ownership is obviously important because it makes things happen. 
happen. But the psychological ownership is really what will keep the member uh, a, a much stronger part of the organization. So you have there uh, the concept of the psychological ownership in a, a very brief definition. So it's a state of mind uh, and the feeling of possessiveness and of being psychologically tied to an object. Uh, object. That's the, the notion of psychological ownership right there. Why uh, the uh, people in marketing? Because this is really uh, is some uh, stuff that comes out of the uh, marketing uh, experts right now. Uh, what do these uh, marketing experts are coming up with. If you're looking at the uh, right section of the screen here, what you see is what they describe and validate empirically as the impact that psychological ownership is going to have to is going to have on the customer's behavior. Uh, relationship intention, which is essentially, uh, you know, to keep doing business with you. So uh, loyalty, word of mouth, references, willingness to pay more, and competitive resistance. So those are the kinds of behavior that marketing experts are looking after when they focus on this concept of psychological ownership. So again, understanding that it's more and more difficult to differentiate an organization to its products and services, for example. So organizations are looking for new dimensions to differentiate themselves and to build sustainable competitive advantage. In that context, the psychological ownership is a source of sustainable competitive advantage that will help to create value. When the, uh, the customers uh, actually feel this notion of psychological ownership, this, this will enhance the value perception that they have from dealing with a specific organization. So that in itself is the, the starting point that I was looking at. And then when you're six, looking six at- Six minutes, Tanya. Five, five minutes? Six, yeah, if you want to jump minutes. ahead okay. to any. Okay. okay, so what you have there is uh, really uh, in, on one slide you have the essence of the, what the theory of psych psychological ownership is all about. So on the left, what you have is the motives. Why do people want to develop psychological ownership? You have a bunch of motives there that are important to understand. So efficacy and effectiveness, effect, effectiveness, what essentially means is that, you know, us as individuals, we want to uh, be, uh, to evolve in an environment that we have a certain degree of control over self-identity, the, the identification is also something uh, when we can identify ourselves to uh, a, a target, specific target, uh, that in itself will help us to essentially uh, define who we are as a person, having a place, so being able to construct our daily, uh, daily, daily life actually is also a motive that will lead people towards this uh, feeling of psychological ownership and stimulation, having fun. And uh, so those are the motives that are inherent in all of us. So when we're looking at how to go from these motives to actually build a feeling of psychological ownership, we have three, what they refer to in this literature as itineraries which we could you know, uh, call essentially strategies to go there. So the first of these itinerary is the, uh, the importance of exercising control. The second one is to coming uh, to know intimately the target that uh, we're gonna want to, to develop uh, psychological ownership uh, with. And the third one is the investment of the self. So when I'm looking at these things, especially uh, these itineraries there, very clearly to me, what uh, came up uh, in my mind when I was uh, you know, discovering this literature is that these, these itineraries are essentially uh, 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 cooperative principles, actually. So uh, the targets that people will develop a psychological ownership feeling towards need to uh, meet a certain number of attributes that you see there, attractiveness, uh, openness, availability, manipulability, accessibility, and visibility. And all of that will lead to uh, these behavior change that I've uh, made the reference to a minute ago. So with this, we have a way to connect with the uh, unique design of a uh, cooperative ownership, actually, because these motives are inherent in members becoming a member of a cooperative. And these causes, as I uh, called there, are, uh, 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 are essentially uh, uh, 
cooperative principles. So all of that will make the cooperative much easier to develop a feeling of psychological ownership. We can also develop collective psychological ownership. I have just uh, about a minute left, so I'm not going to be able to cover that very much. So I'm going to go right away to uh, this idea of, uh, of uh, 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 psychological ownership through time. What you see here in this, uh, in this uh, diagram is really interesting actually. And uh, what I, my hypothesis at this point is that for a cooperative, we can build this notion of psychological ownership, not only because uh, it is of attraction for individuals, but also because it is from a collective point of view, which I didn't have time to really uh, explore there, but from a collective point of view, we also have a, a very strong possibility and capacity actually to build psychological ownership. So for a cooperative to build on this path here, as opposed to, in my hypothesis, for a capitalist organization to build on this path here, makes a, a very uh, significant source of competitive advantage from the point of view of growing a feeling of psychological ownership on the part of the members. So when we're looking at all these things that lead to a uh, much more significant capacity to build psychological ownership from the point of view of cooperatives, we can look at the unique design of cooperative ownership uh, at, the, at the individual level and the, at the collective level. We can look at the, at the very core of the cooperative model, this notion of duality, association and enterprise. The definition of a cooperative is an association of people owning an enterprise. We can look at member, user, owner. We can look at the cooperative rules, rights and responsibilities, uh, democratic vote, users links, the share of surpluses and collective reserves. Uh, we can look at uh, the fact that, you know, with these rules, members are in much better position to control the enterprise. We can look at the primacy of usage over capital. We can look at the structure, the structure of capital which essentially is, facilitates uh, the arbitrage leading to uh, the pursuit of uh, members' well-being. Uh, the ide ideological foundation of cooperatives are uh, also very important. A cooperative is first and foremost a group of human beings. Uh, the social links between the members through the association, the ideal of social justice, all of that leads actually to uh, us being able to recognize that this theory of psychological ownership through the motives, through the itineraries that I've mentioned, through the targets and attributes <clears throat> is something that the cooperative design, ownership design is really meant to grow this notion of psychological ownership. Uh, and this is something that, you know, I've been able to test also with the uh, cooperative, as you say, those are the questions that uh, we asked to measure, actually. You can build a metric about this notion of psychological ownership. So those are the questions that, that we've been asking there. And essentially, uh, the result that we got, and I'm just going you know, to uh, present that in a, in a very, uh, very simple terms here, this notion of psychological ownership, when I'm looking at the impact that it has on customer delight, I was really, really surprised by the very strong impact that it has on customer delight. It doesn't have a strong impact on satisfaction of members, but it has a much stronger impact on this notion of customer delight, which has become, I'm not going to be talking about loyalty today, but this, at the very core of loyalty today, we need to be addressing this notion of customer delight. So there, what this slide shows there is that if I'm able to build a strategy to develop and to grow this notion of psychological ownership with our members, uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna have, uh, say I'm able to grow this metric that I've just uh, mentioned by 10%, for example, the impact on customer delight would be 4%. So that is really significant when you're looking at the ways to address this notion of sustainable cooperative advantage. So to me, very clearly, uh, the, uh, the, the concept of psychological ownership is something that fits extremely well in the cooperative design. 
And uh, this is something that a cooperative can really grow with its members, uh, both at the individual level, because it fits very well with all the motives why people are joining cooperative in the first place. And it fits very well with the principles, actually. Uh, for example, uh, the, uh, the first principle of, uh, you know, being in control. This is something that is at the very core of the cooperative uh, ownership design. Uh, intimately know the target is something that we can approach through cooperative education if we understand how cooperative education can be leveraged to making sure that members understand the target, which is the cooperative, then uh, they are gonna be able to uh, develop uh, a much better identification of themselves with the cooperative, which will lead to a feeling of psychological, psychological ownership. So these these itineraries Danielle, are really. Can we just wrap up in the next minute? We've yeah, got a couple yeah, of questions yeah. coming in. Okay, late. so uh, that's pretty much what I uh, wanted to say, uh, and uh, I think that I'm going to stop here. Uh, I uh, wanted to uh, share uh, something about the cooperative equilibrium and the identity crisis. That I have. Do, those are two concepts that I've been working with, uh, which I believe also are really really important. And I wanted to show uh, uh, that uh, a, a proper framework to approach the management of cooperative is such of an importance, uh, especially in the context where uh, what we do find actually looking at the cooperatives uh, worldwide is that the number of cooperatives are a, a, in a state of identity crisis, actually. The case of the Mountain Equipment Co-op comes to mind uh, very quickly. But it's important to understand that uh, leading to this uh, demutualization, as we see with the Mountain Equipment Co-op, that we have a whole trajectory for cooperatives to go from a uh, starting point where a cooperative is being created uh, through uh, these different decisions that are being made where the cooperative identity is being erased in so many ways, leading to what I call a demutualization from within where the cooperative can stay a long time. And eventually, when you know, certain things happen, in the case of Martin Equipment Cooperative, it's bankruptcy, then it leads to uh, this notion of uh, demutualization. But you know, what is far more important is to understand uh, how we, we get there, actually. And to me, uh, the strategy, the counter strategy to avoid this notion of identity crisis is really to revisit the cooperative model and to rediscover, and this is what I'm doing with the new cooperative paradigm, to rediscover actually that there are inherent advantages in a cooperative model through values and through cooperative principles and so on and so forth. And, and with this, then we can address this notion of competitiveness, competitiveness by not you know, sacrificing the cooperative identity, but uh, contrary to to enhance the cooperative identity. Erin, yeah, I'm going to well, stop here. Danielle, I think you gave too many teasers for us to just uh, jump into questions. But do you think you could quickly just say what is co what what is the cooperative equilibrium in the sense of of how you describe it, just to give us a sense of that? Okay. So uh, if you're pushing for it, I'm going to do that. <laughs> it's your fault, uh, Erin. Well, you know, that's the cooperative equilibrium right there. So uh, this is a model that I built uh, in the, the mid-1990s. I was studying AgriPur. For those of you uh, who are uh, in Canada, uh, AgriPur is certainly a cooperative that you know. It's a, a very big uh, agricultural cooperative, dairy cooperative. Uh, today about uh, seven billion dollars of business. So it's really, really successful. So I was studying these cooperatives about uh, 25 years ago. And uh, it is a, really an amazing cooperative. So uh, by studying the cooperative, trying to understand how they were working actually, uh, I came up with this model that you see there. So the model is really built on four layers. The first one being these specific rules that characterize the cooperative, one member, one vote, losers, links, shares, surplus, and collective reserves. The second layer is this notion of duality, association and uh, association and business, actually. The, uh, the, uh, the third layer is what I call the vertical alignment between the values and purpose, the cooperative business model and the balanced co -card. And the fourth layer is the environment that cooperatives find themselves in 
which is on the right there, what you have is the, uh, the competitive environment. And on the left, what you have is the cooperative environment. So in cooperatives evolve in a, in a uh, very, very uh, uh, structured uh, environment so many times. So essentially in a, a nutshell, that's the idea of the cooperative equilibrium there. And uh, when you're approaching the management of cooperative through this model, you have all the key elements that need to be uh, kept alive and attached to one another, actually, to make sure that we value the cooperative identity into a management approach. And I would say also through a governance approach because the model can be also very much used, useful, can be very useful also from a governance point of view. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, difficult to do that in a minute, but essentially that's the idea of, uh, of the cooperative equilibrium right there. And I've been testing this model uh, for, for all these years. Uh, uh, in the 19, uh, in the 2000s, actually, I was kind of worried that, uh, you know, focusing on this new cooperative uh, paradigm, I didn't know how I was going to be able to attach this with this, uh, this equilibrium model, which was built in my mind based on the traditional cooperative model. And I've come to realize uh, over all these years that this model actually is a very, very efficient model to capture all these things that I've been talking about with respect to congruence of values and with respect to uh, psychological ownership. And if we were to talk about loyalty and engagement, and if we, if we were to talk about co-creation of value, also we would see that all these emerging strategies are a perfect fit that can be enhanced and leveraged in this framework of the cooperative equilibrium. You did it, Danielle. Thank you. <laughs> you know, th this is one of my favorite concepts because it's the one that I find the wheels are turning with people very quickly when they say, oh, I, I hadn't thought of it so simplistically as I want to think about the balance of the economic activity of this cooperative and the fact that we are a, a human based, a person based, an association of people. And just to think of, okay, those are two core elements of the of the cooperative and they both need to be considered in almost every management decision and every governance direction. And, and so I appreciate, um, you know, the way that you can present that yeah. to us and the way it gets us thinking about at least yeah, and, questioning and, what is balance in, in the case of our own cooperatives. Yeah, and uh, one of the key point there is the balance scorecard. And it's quite amazing, actually. And I just did. Uh, with, we just finished the, uh, the the first class that I'm teaching with the Saint Marys, and the students were uh, dealing with this notion of balanced cookard. And the comments that they have is quite, you know, are quite amazing, actually. And with the balanced cookard, if you're a bit familiar with that, you start with the mission and the vision of the organization, the strategy of the organization, and you build an alignment. Actually, you build an alignment based on these uh, different perspectives that uh, you uh, you have in a balanced scorecard. Uh, the financial, of course, but also uh, the the member perspective and the internal processes perspective and the learning learning and growth perspective. And when you when you're looking at the key metrics, actually, that allow you to fully align with the cooperative identity and the cooperative values and, and the, the mission and, and the strategy, then you're able to balance properly and measure the cooperative differences uh, and the values that it generates for uh, its members and uh, for uh, the, its communities actually. And all of that needs to be aligned to uh, the business model, which is also a very, very important concept that we could have been talking for 30 minutes about the business model, such an important concept, especially in the context of erosion. All organizations today face this factor of erosion, which is accelerating actually, which is why we need to look for different strategies, uh, knowing that uh, if you're only looking for strategies based on efficiency, for example, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult and more and more so to differentiate yourself. So we need to look at, of course, we need these things. We need to have a full uh, grasp and uh, master of the, the core business of the organization, but we also need to build new dimensions around this core business that will allow an organization to really differentiate itself in the world that we're facing right now. So the balance scorecard and the business model, and the business model allows us to fully look at this new cooperative paradigm and to 
you know, to, to embed in a business model these notions of congruence of values and these notions of, of uh, uh, psychological ownership, actually, which are so important and will have an impact on making the model cooperative and sustainable. Thank you, Danielle. Okay, we'll jump into a question. So Abe uh, Grasswitz uh, from New Jersey has a question on, uh, on if, you're, if you're analyzing and looking at congruence of values within the organization and then you find that in fact you don't have that, what you talked about as um, you know, benevolence and universalism, if you don't see that within your cooperative, uh, where do you go from there? <laughs> Well, that's a good question. Um, of course, if the, the leaders don't share on these values, it's not going to happen. So you have to have values are not something that uh, can be uh, you know, forced on people. You know, this is something that uh, you grow with. Uh, this is part of us. This is who we are. So I strong, strongly believe that the cooperative leaders need to share these, these values, the cooperative values. And if you want to uh, look at it through the Schwartz model, the self-transcendence values, uh, this is really, really important. And then, then, and, and, and then you know, uh, you have to uh, hire the right people. You have to hire the right people. And, and then, then you are able to work on the alignment uh, with the employees uh, on the basis of these values. That's where the congruence comes, up, comes, up, come, 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 comes up with. And you can also uh, look at congruence, not only on the point of view of the employees, which is what the concept is telling us, but more and more, you can look at this notion of congruence. And this is something that I've started to do with Co-op HCC. That's why I wanted to see where the community that I uh, was with for more than 40 years, you know, I was involved with this community for 40 years. I'm still involved in the different role, but you know, I was there for 40 years. And I wanted to know uh, what was the profile, the value profile of this community. And there what you have is a congruence of values that is not only with the employees, but also with the members. And this is really, really powerful when you think about this. So, uh, but you know, if you don't have the leaders that believe and behave based on these values, it's not gonna happen. Unfortunately. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, it's a it's a real call to action to even look at our HR practices and as a board who we're hiring, you know, in terms of, of the lead of the organization, because yeah that you you don't trickle down and you, not the trickle down works but you know you don't share anything different um, than what you see sort of inculcated into the the business planning the leadership the speak at the meetings and so forth it's uh you know it's essential that we're we're considering things like values and approaches to the cooperative business as a unique thing that needs to be essential to how we do our recruitment and also training as well Mm, yeah, and what, what's the uh, the leaders uh, starting with the board? You know, recognize that the cooperative values are a uh, distinct source of competitive advantage. Uh, then you can you know really build on this this alignment. You know, true, and you're making reference to uh, <clears throat> HR policies. Uh, so it's really important that you know all these values will be embedded in these policies. Um, yeah, and. Uh, so the board will have to play a key role there, hiring the right people. That's true. Uh, we have a uh, comment from Andrew Escobar who said, you know, they were very much excited about getting into the uh, the portion on identity crisis, and and I wonder if that's going to be part of our winter webinar series. Is jumping uh -huh. into. Danielle, we could have you speak every day. We know this, um, but but why don't we say that we will do another webinar coming up in the next few months, and and we can focus in on identity crisis specifically because I think just that to unpack that will be really useful. Um, you might get a chance to speak to it. We just have a few minutes left, but Andrew did have a question as well. Um, uh, there is a growing imitation and outright creation of banks by financial co-ops, and they face increasingly similar constraints as banks do due to fintech disrupt disruption and so forth. But what will a new co-op paradigm look like in that realm? Well, <clears throat> the new cooperative paradigm uh, is, uh, I mean, these strategies that have been talking about congruence of values, uh, 
uh, for example, when you're looking at uh, the, the capitalist model, uh, the values that you have there are much more aligned with self-enhancement, which is the, uh, <clears throat> the purpose of self-enhancement is the power and, uh, and wealth uh, from a self-interest uh, point of view. So uh, these organizations will have uh, difficulty uh, imitate actually uh, the cooperative model uh, with respect to this notion of congruence of values once we understand the importance of self-transcendence, uh, which is another way again of talking about cooperative values. So if you're talking about organizations that try to imitate cooperatives but don't have these inherent values, uh, uh, I mean, they're not gonna be able to, uh, to uh, make it happen the way that a cooperative can. And going back to this notion of uh, sustainable cooperative advantage, competitive advantage, uh, you know, I was talking about, you know, creating value for the members. I was talking about rare, rarity. I was talking about difficulty to imitate. And when you're looking at difficulty to imitate, uh, you know, this is an important element because uh, there's this notion of uh, historical path dependency. Think about the history of cooperatives. Go back, going back to Rockdale, for example. So the cooperative history is 175 years uh, of, uh, you know, effort to, to build on these, these unique values. So this is really something that is really, really difficult to imitate. The ambiguity of all these things that I'm talking about is clearly established. There's no doubt about this. And the complex, the complexity, the social complexity of, of the, the, this whole thing, it makes the, the whole, the whole, you know, approach uh, of congruence of values very difficult to imitate, actually. So I would be very confident that uh, a cooperative model that fully understand its, its core identity is going to be able to do things that other organizations, even if they're trying to imitate, they're not going to be able to to go certainly as far as the cooperatives on that on on, on these on these, uh, and especially if we're looking at uh, a, a third level of congruence with with the members. So I believe that the cooperatives have a a significant advantage there. Thank you, Danielle. Well, we could go on all day. <laughs> it's been an amazingly packed hour. <laughs> I knew it would be. Um, hopefully folks are um, realizing that there's a, a lot of places they can go in terms of reflecting on some of these concepts in terms of what it means in their own organizations. And I have attached in the chat the slides if you want to sit with them a little bit longer. Um, like I said, we will add another, Danielle Willing, which I think he is, um, at another webinar where we go deeper on the concept of identity crisis, which I think is uh, as Danielle said, very relevant to where co-ops are right now and in terms of trying to find their way and, and how to maintain a competitive advantage and delight members as well. Um, and not lose some of those roots from the founders of the cooperative. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and include some links to our future webinars in the, uh, in the chat here. So management, I don't think the links are sticking. So managementstudies.coop is where you'll find the registration links to all three of those upcoming webinars uh, coming up, or you can just go there to the main page and scroll down. You'll see recordings from past webinars and links to our future webinars too in this series. Um, we also are setting up our winter series. So if any of you uh, have burning topics, you can put them in the chat now, or you can email me as well. Uh, if you think that you'd like to step forward as a speaker for an upcoming webinar, we'd be delighted uh, to have more people's voices in the mix, especially folks who identify as BIPOC. Uh, we wanna continually make sure that we put more and more people um, on the platform so we can be sharing the nuances of how cooperatives are expressed in our economy. Um, and the challenges that we all face as well. So I will uh, also let folks know, reminder again, that we are doing a two-day course on member-centric management and governance coming up in December. And we're offering that course again in uh, February. That's hosted by Karen Miner and Sonia Malkovich. And, uh, and I wanna thank everybody for being here with us today. We'll make sure that the link to this uh, recording is up on our website uh, by end of day tomorrow. I'm gonna aim to do it today, but if there's any glitches, we'll get it up there by tomorrow. So uh, you'll see that Danielle's uh, 
book link is also there if you're interested in reading more. Uh, Danielle loves every time people reach out to him asking questions about their own cooperatives. So um, you'll be able to uh, reach out to him as well. I'll put another of the link in again for his book there. So I want to invite, if anybody wants to stay on the line for a few minutes and chat and ask questions, I know some others have come through in the chat, please do so. But to all of you who are just here for the hour, I wanna thank you so much for being here, for taking an active uh, sort of analysis in cooperatives and in your own cooperative. And thank you so much to Danielle for sharing with us today and continuing to be someone who pushes forward the sort of strategic conversations about cooperatives and, and what, we, what we can and should be doing that has our cooperatives thrive in a cooperative way. So thank you everyone. Uh, please stay safe and stay sane out there. And if anybody wants to unmute for further conversation, please do so. So Danielle, Abe had a question earlier, which I think is a good one. It really had to do with, uh, he says, different types of co-ops have different levels of emotional buy-in. So a credit union is not necessarily a place where members um, know other members well. A multi-stakeholder cooperative like Northwest River Public House, where people gather around food and music, have more of emotional buy-in. I think I've been there. Um, and... Uh, Let's see, an income sharing commune has even more. So is building community and emotional buy-in an important part of this type of organizational development? Good question. Building communities? Building communities? Building community, like connection between the peer members. Well, the connection is important, definitely. Uh, if, you know, I didn't have time to really cover the uh, the collective ownership, uh, psycho ownership part, but uh, this is what it's all about. Uh, and uh, for for a collective uh, psychological feeling of psycho ownership to, to, to grow and to develop, actually, you have to have people sharing on, on uh, the feelings towards your target, could be the organization. Uh, people need also uh, be uh, sharing on beliefs uh, uh, and, and, and and knowledge actually about about the organization. Uh, so for that to happen, you need to have uh, social links uh, with with between co cooperative uh, members. Uh, and uh, I think that the the, the cooperative model, uh, when you're looking at the way that you know it is being structured through this notion of duality, association, and enterprise, uh, this is really something that uh, leads us towards this notion of the collective uh, 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 psychological ownership. So uh, clearly, by focusing on on uh, psychological ownership, you can develop. A uh, stronger uh, emotional attachment on the part of the member, both at the individual level and at the collective level. When people are able to recognize that one another, you know, you and I uh, share the same the same values, share the same the same beliefs, uh, uh, and the same motives. Actually, uh, you know, uh, to to engage into uh, into this uh, sort of organization. So this is where the, the, the association will grow. This is where the, the social links between between these these members will uh, will grow. Uh, and uh, and all that leads to a uh, stronger stronger uh, cooperative. One thing that you know I uh, it's not exactly your question, but it it allows me to 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 address that uh, in a certain way. Uh, one of the things that I've seen as an issue with respect to this notion of psychological ownership, it's 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 always uh, something uh, that you know people working in corpuses will talk about members' engagement and this notion of psychological ownership is a way actually to, to really leverage this, this notion of engagement. Though uh, what is in it as well that needs to be understood is that uh, we need to empower people. For them to grow this feeling of psychological ownership, they need to be empowered. And sharing power is not something that we're very good at, even if we are in a cooperative environment. So, uh, and this is something that I'm experiencing with, with my own co-op, uh, 
uh, you know, I've been talking to uh, my management team uh, at Camp HCC for a couple of years now about this notion of psychological ownership. And of course they say, yes, 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 yes. But they do no, 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 because uh, it means that they're gonna have to share power and they're not ready for that. So uh, there is a uh, notion of the readiness that is really important if we want to be focusing on that. Readiness in the part of the organization, readiness in the part of the management, uh, readiness in the part of the organization, readiness also in the part of the uh, the, the members. And that's why uh, this, this idea of the cooperative education is so important because we can help people to prepare for uh, these, uh, you know, uh, these uh, transfer of power actually. So uh, that in itself uh, makes uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, this strategy uh, quite complex to, to implement, but uh, we can do it. Thanks for your question, Abe. Sure. It, it does point, I think Abe's question also points to um, different approaches. So sometimes when we talk about cooperatives, we know that everybody sort of takes in these models in a little bit of a different way based on their specific ownership structure or even just the culture of their cooperative. But if we look at different, um, say, economic lines, so if we look at, say, credit unions versus a, an agricultural cooperative owned by farmers, then, you know, how how do some of these concepts apply differently? Like a consumer co-op where myself, uh, as a credit union member, I'm looking for the best rate on my mortgage. And that's why I shop around to different organizations and choose X credit union. Um, you know, it might be a bit based on values, but I'm also sort of approaching it transactionally. Like, you know, me as an individual, is this gonna be in this moment, the best benefit to me compared to a FinTech? Um, I think that it's a lot different orientation to the models that you're presenting than like in, in terms of congruence of values. Me saving $10,000 on my mortgage might be more motivating than being congruent with my values. What do you think, Dania? <laughs> Well, uh, I think that you know everybody will will have uh, uh, will pay a great deal of attention to what you what you uh, what you just said, but uh, we uh, can you know uh, push the members' attachment. If you know I'm using mm -hmm. this this expression, we can push it further. Uh, but the first contact, the first element that people will be looking at, you know, is there. Until until uh, you can you can prove actually that uh, there is more than price. If you're not able to differentiate yourself, you know, uh, customers, members included, uh, will shop, uh, you know, uh, intelligently, uh, and they will go for price. Uh, so you have to be uh, able to, uh, you know, uh, build this difference. You cannot expect the members actually to see the difference where there is not. And that's why this notion of uh, identity crisis is so important. Uh, when you have these cooperatives in what I referred to as the third quadrant here, which is what I referred to demutualization from within. So you still have cooperative at the, you know, at the top of the door, uh, but everything else inside is essentially what the capitalist organizations are doing. So there is no differentiation there. When you don't have a differentiation, I mean, the members are smart. You are not offering any differences, dif different differences. So what are they gonna do? They're gonna shop for price, which may, to me makes plenty of sense. So it is our job as cooperative leaders actually to build this differentiation that will have value for them. Going back to this notion of sustainable competitive advantage, the first question is what value does it bring to the members? If we're not able to answer that, they're gonna be shopping for price. And psychological ownership creates value because it will create this feeling of effectiveness, me in my environment. It will create a feeling where I'm going to identify myself and define myself better, knowing what the cooperative is all about in terms of organization and so on and so forth. So we need to build this difference. And oftentimes you see people talking about that without you know, coming up with the solution. The solution needs to come from the organization. It's not the member's role actually to build the differentiation. 
it is the organization's and the leader's role in the cooperative to build differentiation. Otherwise, they're going to be shopping for, you know, price. That's it. It's like That's you it. just played my favorite song, Danielle. I just couldn't get enough of what you were saying. <laughs> it's just, I love this quote you said, you can't expect the members to see a difference where there is not. And I was sort of poking, poking the bear a bit when I asked that question, because I find often, if we see it a lot, when you recruit folks who are experts in that economic line, but they're not experts in cooperatives, they tend to drive things just like you would a capitalist firm. So they mm -hmm. think like, oh, we're going to give people points, we're going to give discounts, and we're, you know, we're X, Y, Z, we're going to really, you know, serve them in that way, but they're missing that true difference that can be the cooperative model and how folks build affinity and loyalty to like, I am the co-op used to be the motto that we had in my food co-op. Um, we are the co-op. And, you know, and that you just point to it perfectly, which is to say, if, if there is no real difference that we're expressing, then members would only be smart to ask questions of price sure. and personal benefit. You're right. Yeah. And if you look at the, uh, what, 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 uh, what appears on the screen there, uh, you know, when I'm talking about first, second, third, and fourth generation of managers, I'm referring to a uh, research that was done in Italy by two historian uh, researchers who looked at four generations of cooperative managers through time, starting in the late 19, uh, 1940s, actually, all the way to today. And what they're coming up with is that these managers, 60, 70, 80 years ago, they understood the co-op model. They may, no, they were not, you know, as uh, trained as managers, but they understood the co-op model. Today, the managers in these Italian cooperatives, they are well-trained. They come out of business schools like the one that I was working with, but they don't understand the co-op model. So by not understanding the co-op model, they pursue exactly what you just said, you know. They pursue a set of behavior, which is what they've learned. No, they've been trained to do that. So they pursue a set of behavior, a strategy uh, that essentially leads the transformation of the organization towards what I call demutualization from within. And then something happens. It could be a bankruptcy. It could be, you know, some other decisions. Normally, these decisions at that point are not being made by the members. They, they are being made by the third party. And then you have demutualization totally. So uh, the notion that uh, the cooperative leaders understand the cooperative model is such an important one. And that is why, uh, to me, this concept of new cooperative paradigm is so important because it allows us to rephrase the narrative, the way that we're talking about co-ops in a completely different way. And to recognize that by revisiting this model, we can rephrase the narrative in a way that allows us to really sustain the conversation with respect to being cooperative and being different. And this is so important. And so many times, you know, uh, when I started to uh, work on this idea of identity crisis, it was, you know, 20 some years ago. And I was, uh, you know, involved with a program. For those of you who know a little bit of Quebec, we have a, a very important, uh, uh, we call them cooperative bank, uh, Desjardins, Desjardins movement. You know, 50% uh, of market share, more than $300 billion of assets. So it's a huge, huge thing. Uh, and at that time, they were doing a, uh, a, uh, a reengineering of the process. And they wanted us at HEC to teach them about uh, uh, leadership of change and all that stuff. And I was able to squeeze a course on cooperative management there. First time and the last time that I was able to do that with HEC. And the first, the first morning that I was with, and I had 300 managers from Desjardins coming to this course. And the first morning with all these people, 13 groups that I had over a two year period, what they were talking about was, we don't know about it anymore. We don't know how to differentiate ourselves anymore. 
They just didn't have the proper narrative, the proper concepts actually, to be able not only to approach the management of cooperative, but to, to, to justify being cooperative still today in the context of globalization and transformation of markets and so on and so forth. So not being able to argue and argument actually on the value of the cooperative model leads to this notion of, you know, uh, demutualization from within, and eventually it leads to, no, to the notion to the to 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 the demutualization the demutualization of the cooperative altogether. So it's so important to have this capacity to develop a understanding of the cooperative identity and to argue. Uh, in positive terms, that cooperative is a way forward, which is what I believe. To me, cooperatives are a model for the future. Danielle, that's a perfect place to stop. I think we've got another event happening on this channel soon. So I want to thank you, Danielle. Uh, I think these last 15 minutes were super rich too. So I've left the recording going so people can check that out too. Um, and thank you, Danielle, for, for all of your work leading up to being able to talk about these things so, so clearly with so much evidence. And uh, for everyone else for being here and uh, for being who you are in your cooperatives in the economy too. Eric, can I say just two more words? Of course you can, Daniel. <laughs> okay, I just want to refer to tipping points. Okay. Uh, and I want to refer to community of practice. Those are obsessions that I have on these two words, tipping points, because I believe that we are at a tipping, tipping point right now with respect to where the cooperative model goes. And if we let this identity crisis take over the cooperative model, the cooperative movement, you know, in the next few years, we're going to see so much more examples like MEC. I strongly believe that. So tipping points is also with respect to uh, the emergence of new market rules that really favor the cooperative model. So we need to understand that in order to develop this new narrative, as I was saying. So that's one element. And the other element that I'm really obsessed with is this notion of community of practice. It's one thing to understand all these things about the new cooperative paradigm and the potential that the cooperative model has. It's another thing to really uh, build on it and show how it can really be implemented in, in reality. And for that to happen, we need to accelerate the knowledge that we have of this model. That's why this notion of community of practice is so important. I've tried twice over the last four or five years to build community of practice, and I was successful somewhat, but uh, not enough so that, you know, I could say that uh, we've succeeded. But I'm just, you know, sending the invitation to all of you who uh, would be interested in working with these things, on these things, uh, to, uh, you know, contact Aaron, to contact me, uh, and uh, see how we can move forward, actually, uh, and accelerate the learning that we need to do uh, on this notion of new cooperative paradigm, facing this identity crisis that is so much there right now. Thank you, Danielle. Appreciate that. Um, okay. And I see Susan there, and Susanna was part of the, the first community of practice that uh, we uh, put together. You know, she was very much part of it, so uh, we had a good time there. <laughs> okay, thank you everyone. We're going to end it here again. I invite you to participate with us in future webinars to stay in touch. If you find yourself uh, anxious, excited, frustrated about any of the concepts that came up today and or as you apply your co-op against those concepts, <laughs> please stay in touch because we're all in this together. Um, I can't think of one co-op who has everything figured out. And so, you know, it, it's important that we continue to stay in this conversation so that we, we evolve our co-ops and, and don't become irrelevant to our members. And, uh, and like Danielle said, don't demutualize from within or actually. Um, the name of Danielle's book is uh, Cooperative Management. I'll link it again there in the chat. And I want to thank everyone for being here today, and we'll close it off there. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye, everyone. Got it, Abe? Okay. Great. Thank you. Take care.
Danielle, I've got the slides. I've included them for folks. So they'll be okay, very good. Then. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Bye-bye.